Thank you, Tatiana, for putting information in the chat. So reminding us about the reason for our, our poll. So we're almost at the top of the hour. If you haven't completed the poll, if you wouldn't mind to do so, if you're just joining us, we'll get started in about another minute. It looks like we're at the, the top of the hour, high noon sharp. So Dr. Ramirez, do you want to introduce uh, Sarah? To oh, yeah. It's another, another member of the team that probably doesn't need too much of an introduction, but you know, Sarah Moore is another of our uh, clinical uh, pharmacists, ID clinical pharmacists. Uh, and again, the, the idea of these grand rounds is to to have an, an approach from the pharmacy point of view, microbiology, infection control, the microbial stewardship. Uh, and, and I can see that today, Sarah is going to um, uh, touch into a very important uh, topic in the area of management of respiratory infections. Yeah, Sarah, the remote. thank you. And go ahead, please. Do you have the remote? And I'll change it to this. Well, I'll just remind everybody, if you don't mind, mute yourselves as we're getting started. But as Dr. Ramirez said, I will be focusing today on management of community acquired pneumonia with a particular focus on optimal length of therapy for our antibiotics. Um, so we'll be talking a lot throughout today about a mantra that we hear very commonly in the world of antimicrobial stewardship, which is shorter is better. Uh, so before we get too far down the road, um, I do want to put out a little disclaimer. So for anybody who has not seen me in person, I am just north of five foot. Um, but I want to make sure that we are all aware that when we're talking about shorter is better, it does not actually refer to the quality of infectious diseases pharmacists. Uh, so this is specifically about antibiotic length of therapy, and all ID pharmacists are perfect exactly the way that they are. So uh, now that we've got that established, we can talk a little bit more about where this mantra actually comes into management of antimicrobial chemotherapy. So shorter is better first started to kind of make its way into the literature um, around the mid 2010s. And there was really this big call for this. Probably the loudest voice and biggest champion for that cause has been a physician, Dr. Brad Spellberg, who practices out in Southern California. So Dr. Spellberg has written about this topic quite a bit, as well as has an entire website that he maintains uh, pulling literature to suggest that shorter is better in many, many different infectious disease states. Uh, however, when he first started kind of writing on this topic, he pointed out that many of our conventions around antimicrobial chemotherapy prescribing seem to date back to a period in history in the early uh, 300 ADs. 
So Constantine was a Roman emperor at that time, and he was the person who popularized the week. So our seven-day length of therapies that we see actually probably come from this conventional use of the week that we utilized first around work structures. Uh, now, Constantine, as a Roman emperor, was not an expert in the treatment of infectious diseases, so taking his strategies and applying them to something that they were never intended for is probably not the best or only way to think about antimicrobial lengths of therapy. So we're not necessarily tied to these durations that are multiples of seven, just because Constantine came up with that as a system. Now, one of the other analogies that I've heard around antimicrobial length of therapy that I also like is from uh, my previous residency program director in Indianapolis, Christian Cheatham. And he talked about how we seem to be locked into the idea of utilizing football scores to come up with our antibiotic length of therapy. So there's multiples of seven, obviously, again, we'll see. Uh, but if you've had the pleasure of doing antimicrobial stewardship, you probably have had a conversation where we talk about stopping therapy on day eight. And often the answer is, oh, well, we might as well just go out to day 10 at this point. Uh, we might as well just kick the field goal. And again, we're not necessarily beholden to these specific antibiotic length of therapies. So um, I would like to instead use an analogy with a sport that I like even better, where we actually do have the option to count by ones and we don't have to continue to that next specified duration of therapy. So now that we've talked about that concept of shorter is better overall, we can turn our attention a little bit more towards community-acquired pneumonia specifically. So I wanted to start by just covering some of the history around how we have traditionally treated community-acquired pneumonia over the years. So Looking back at some of the old Infectious Diseases Society of America and American Thoracic Society guidelines, we see um, a little bit of change over time. So the first guideline set that I wanted to talk about came out in 1998. Uh, and what they said is in terms of antibiotic duration of therapy, they didn't really have a specific minimum or maximum, but suggested that patients should probably be afebrile for at least 72 hours before we would stop antibiotic therapy. In 2007, there was another update to the guidelines, and this is where we see that five-day duration that we're going to talk about in our current guidelines as well. They said that that would be appropriate uh, so long as the patient had been afebrile for 48 to 72 hours, as well as had some other signs of clinical stability. And in 2019, where we got our most recent guideline update, we see that this five-day duration is in there again, and we can talk about it in a little bit more detail in terms of which patients this would be appropriate in. So again, our current guidelines say that patients with community-acquired pneumonia should be treated for at least five days. This would apply to any patients who have achieved clinical stability. And what that actually means is that they have normal vital signs. So their respiratory rate is normal, blood pressure is normal, um, as well as that they're able to eat and that they have normal mental status. Um, a caveat that I would add to this is we're probably looking for normal mental status for that patient's baseline. So for example, if they have dementia and aren't alert and oriented at baseline, that's probably not a realistic expectation for that patient at the end of their pneumonia treatment anyhow. The guidelines then bring up that if we reach day five and the patient hasn't reached clinical stability, there's a couple different things we can think about. So if it seems like the patient has been improving on antibiotics, but they're just not quite there yet, then we may extend our therapy out a little bit longer. But if the patient isn't making significant clinical improvement, then the couple of things we might want to consider is, does this patient have a more resistant organism that we need to change up our antibiotic therapy? Or does this patient not actually have community-acquired pneumonia at all, and we have an entirely separate infectious diseases issue or non-infectious problem that needs to be addressed instead? So in terms of where that five-day duration comes from, I did want to discuss some of the evidence that the guidelines reference and talk about why this actually makes sense. So the first of this studies I wanted to discuss is actually done back in 2003. So it's quite um, a bit older at this point. Uh, what we had was patients who were hospitalized with CAP, and these were adults. And though this study was actually originally designed to look at trying to find the best possible dose of levofloxacin, it did give us quite a bit of insight into 
appropriate length of therapy as well. So what they did is gave five days of levofloxacin followed by five days of placebo or gave 10 days of levofloxacin. So patients were randomized into one of those two groups. We had just about 200 patients in each group. And what we saw was very similar clinical success rates between those two groups. The second study I wanted to look at um, was done in 2016. Again, we have a relatively similar design. These were adult patients with community-acquired pneumonia who were hospitalized, um, but this one wasn't specific to levofloxacin. It actually primarily looked at patients uh, who were also on things like beta-lactams, which is typically the type of treatment that we use in our own practice. So it's nice to see this duration in other types of medications as well. This one was designed a, pretty similarly, but what they did is looked at patients only at day five of therapy and assessed them for those clinical stability criteria, so normal vital signs, able to eat, and normal mentation. If all of those things were present at day five, then we could go ahead and randomize them to either stop antibiotics or to go into the treatment arm where the physician decided the length of therapy based on their clinical judgment. So what we see is that we had a, just under 150 patients in both of those groups. And the first thing that's interesting is the antibiotic length of therapy comparison between the two groups. So as we would expect, if we stopped antibiotics at day five, our median length of therapy was five days. However, if we left it up to the prescriber discretion, what we see is that the median duration got all the way up to 10 days. So there is a significant difference there in following those guidelines really to a T and what the providers were choosing to do based on what they're seeing with the patient. Now we can move on to talking about the clinical outcomes though. So in comparing five days versus 10 days, we see that clinical success rates were similar between the groups. The same thing with in-hospital mortality as well as 30-day mortality. So there are no statistically significant differences in outcomes between these two groups. Now, in terms of the two studies I just talked about, there are a few groups of people who would have been excluded from those investigations, and I think that's just something that we should probably be aware of. So this list isn't totally comprehensive, but I wanted to point out that we didn't include those who were immunocompromised, who are at risk of pseudomonas infection, so a more resistant isolate that's typically not covered by most of our first-line therapies, those who needed a chest tube or had a particularly complicated pneumonia, folks who were pregnant or breastfeeding, had previously failed other antibiotics, or had some other site of infection. So overall, folks who were concerned aren't going to be able to mount an adequate immune response or have these particularly complicating factors or resistant infections, those are people who may not fit into these studies and maybe the guidelines don't apply quite as directly to. It's not to say that we can consider these five-day durations in somebody who's immunocompromised, but it's going to be not quite as clear cut. So our first key takeaway is just that overall, five days of antibiotics appears to be as effective as longer courses for community-acquired pneumonia again, in those patients who meet those clinical stability criteria. So now that we've talked about the evidence behind the guidelines, and we know that shorter is better, the question is, is even shorter better? So there was actually a recent study that looked at three days compared to eight days of antibiotic therapy for treatment of community-acquired pneumonia. And they found very similar outcomes between those groups as well. Now, I don't want to get really in depth in discussing this trial. And I really just want to bring it up because as we're talking about this five-day duration, I think that this study points out that we still may not know exactly what's optimal in all of our patients. So one of the great things about practicing medicine or pharmacy and working in healthcare is that things are constantly changing. We're continuing to push the envelope and get better and better evidence. Uh, so it's really exciting that our practice gets to continue to grow and change to catch up to what's truly going to be optimal for our patients. Now, we can turn our attention from what we should be doing to what we actually are doing. So in terms of what happens in practice, there's a couple different studies that I wanted to go over. 
So these go from 2018 uh, through 2022 in terms of the publication dates, uh, but all of these studies took place after that 2007 IDSA guideline update. So five days of therapy was guideline recommended, provided that patients were clinically stable during the time period that all of these studies took place. So that's something for us to keep in mind when we're interpreting the results. So the first is a very large study uh, done retrospectively. This was adult patients who were hospitalized with CAP across over 3,000 hospitals between 2012 and 2013. So this study looked at these patients based on ICD-10 code. So the diagnosis that the provider said that they were treating, said that they were treating community acquired pneumonia in these cases. Key components of the design were that when these investigators were evaluating for appropriate antibiotic length of therapy, they assumed clinical stability at hospital discharge, which I would argue is probably fairly reasonable. If we thought a patient was stable enough to go home, they're probably meeting our cr appropriate criteria for thinking about stopping antibiotics as well. They then reviewed total antibiotic length of therapy. And in terms of what they found, we saw that our median length of therapy was nine and a half days of antibiotics. So well above that recommended five-day duration. Additionally, uh, about two thirds of those patients received greater than seven days of antibiotic therapy. So we see that whatever we're defaulting to on a national level seems to be longer than that recommended five-day duration. So the next study I wanted to talk about was done by Dr. Valerie Vaughn and her group at the time up in Michigan. And if you're interested in learning more about antimicrobial stewardship overall, Dr. Vaughn's research is an excellent resource across many common disease states. So just a quick plug for uh, her group and the research that they do overall is very high quality. Um, this one, again, similarly, we have a retrospective study in adult patients hospitalized with CAP across 43 hospitals in Michigan. And again, they included these folks based on ICD-10 codes. In terms of our design, they actually went in and did reviews on these patients looking for when they reached clinical stability and actually did these individual evaluations to try to determine if those patients received appropriate lengths of therapy for their community-acquired pneumonia. Again, they reviewed length of therapy and also reviewed for adverse drug reactions. So what they found is that based on, even when these patients were clinically stable, about two thirds of them received excessive antibiotic length of therapy. So in this particular study, it looked like even when patients were clearly meeting those criteria, for whatever reason, we're tending to treat a little bit longer than is really necessary. Interestingly, they also found that excessive length of therapy was associated with an increase in adverse drug events. So again, if we do stewardship work, we know that the longer a patient is on antibiotics, the more likely something is to go wrong. So this isn't a particularly surprising finding, but it's still helpful for us to see it truly documented in the literature. Now, the last study I'd like to talk about was actually done here by our group at Norton Healthcare. And if you're saying to yourself, okay, well, they've got problems across the nation. We've got problems in Michigan, but we probably do better here in Louisville and in Kentucky. I would like you to prepare yourself to be disappointed. So we did a similar study where we looked at hospitalized patients with community acquired pneumonia here at Norton and looked at them based on those ICD-10 codes. Our design also assumed clinical stability at hospital discharge. We reviewed total antibiotic length of therapy as well as discharge length of therapy. And the key results that I'd like to share with you all is that our median length of therapy was also nine and a half days. So we see that we're also tending to very commonly exceed that recommended five day duration. Another interesting finding here is that our median discharge length of therapy was five days. So we are defaulting at hospital discharge to giving a course which should cover really that patient's entire need to be treated uh, for their community acquired pneumonia. So looking at this data a little bit differently, what we have here is the frequency of various antibiotic durations found in our study. So you can see that it actually goes all the way up to 23 days as the maximum in this patient group. There's our median at nine and a half days. So just 
To frame that, 50% of patients received at least 10 days of antibiotic therapy. And interestingly enough, our median hospital length of stay was down here at three and a half days. So again, if we assume that patients were clinically stable back here at this median hospital length of therapy, we can see that we probably excessively treated a lot of these patients. Turning our attention to the discharge prescribing, uh, what we have highlighted in green here is the most frequently prescribed durations of antibiotics at hospital discharge. So as I already mentioned, we fre most frequently prescribed five days, but overall, 76% of those patients were prescribed five, seven, or 10 days at discharge. And this is a phenomenon that we sometimes see referred to as prescribing convention or prescribing etiquette where we essentially just fall into habits and aren't necessarily doing a lot of individualized patient evaluation to make our decisions. We just, again, have a habit where I prescribe five days at discharge and I don't think too much about it. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're kind of up against in the world of antimicrobial stewardship for community acquired pneumonia is just seeing that sometimes convention really drives a lot of our decision making rather than being considerate of what's actually going on with that patient. So our next key takeaway is despite that guideline recommendation, we treat CAP for longer than five days. So this is a huge opportunity to shorten up our length of therapy and really promote antimicrobial stewardship in these patients. So the, even though we just talked about that this is an opportunity, here's the why we even care about it in the first place. So what we know is that excessive antibiotic length of therapy leads to increased adverse effects. We saw that with the Vaughn study that we just discussed. We also know that excessive length of therapy leads to an increase in C. difficile infections. So we've had a whole grand rounds talking about antibiotic exposure and C. difficile risk. So if you care to learn more about that, you're welcome to uh, visit that entire presentation as well. But we know the longer that patients are on antibiotics, the more likely we are to see collateral damage to their GI flora and their higher risk for contracting C. difficile infection. The next piece can be an increase in excessive cost. Now, the drugs that we tend to use to treat community-acquired pneumonia are usually not terribly expensive, and to that individual patient, a couple extra days is probably not going to really break the bank. But when we're talking about one of the most infectious or common infectious diseases that afflicts people all across the country, that excessive cost both to hospitals and to individual patients really starts to add up when we talk about how many people um, are receiving probably double the antibiotic length of therapy that's really required. And then last, we know that excessive antibiotic exposure also increases the pressure for the development of resistant bacteria. So overall, the more that bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, the more likely we are to select out for resistant isolates. Uh, so this is one of our huge goals with the antimicrobial stewardship is to help prevent the development of resistance. So in terms of how we can best address this problem moving forward, the first piece that we need to all be doing is education on the guidelines and the evidence behind it. So having conversations like this one where we talk about why the guidelines are the way they are and develop an understanding of the evidence behind them helps us all feel more comfortable when we're following them. The next piece is to identify gaps in what the evidence says and how we're actually practicing. So similar to the study that we did here locally that Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Yee's groups were doing, we see that what we know we should be doing and what we are currently doing aren't actually lining up. So then what we get to do next is implement practice change and try to bring our practice a little bit closer to what's actually recommended. And what we know about people overall, this is not exclusive to medicine, is change can sometimes be uncomfortable or a little bit challenging for us, but ultimately it's for the good of our patients. So continuing to hone our craft and try to get cl as close to ideal treatments as possible is the absolute best thing we can do for our patients. And this is indeed possible. So I wanted to share with you all one more study that looked at how to implement this type of practice change in community-acquired pneumonia.
So this was a quasi-experimental multi-center pre and post study in patients hospitalized with CAP. So very similar to the patient populations we've looked at so far. Um, this was, as I said, multi-center, so across multiple different states. And what they did was a huge education campaign and then set up their antimicrobial stewardship teams to have lists of community-acquired pneumonia patients and make all sorts of recommendations on appropriate length of therapy for these folks. Some key components of the design is that they excluded anybody who was complicated or critically ill. So they did try to really focus in on those patients who were going to likely clinically stabilize within that five-day duration. And what they did is evaluated impact on length of therapy and on mortality. So in their before period, median length of therapy for these CAP patients was nine days, and the recommended five-day treatment duration was utilized in 4.9% of patients. But after their massive education campaign and making all these patient recommendations, we saw that the median duration of therapy decreased to six days, and that five-day duration was utilized in 35.2% of patients. So even though we weren't using it in 100% of people, this is still a massive decrease in antibiotic length of therapy on a population level. The other key component here is that there was no impact on patient mortality. So we were able to use fewer antibiotics and not see any negative ramifications when it comes to our patient outcomes, which is always exactly what we hope for with antimicrobial stewardship interventions. So overall, very successful study in showing how we might decrease antimicrobial length of therapy in our CAP patients. So with that, I will go ahead and open it up for any questions. Thank you. This was a great um, overview. I think, you know, one of the first things that comes to my mind are, are you know, some of the, the steps that we've talked about different um, facilities can take because our people on the line are representing a variety of different uh, healthcare settings. So maybe just some uh, general advice on how they might be able to look at this as part of their not only clinical practice, but really their stewardship programs. And then uh, I'm sure Dr. Ramirez will have some, some additional clinical and uh, other questions to, to ask. Sure. So a couple of the different strategies, um, like we already kind of discussed, education is a huge component. Um, especially for our hospitalists, there are a lot of different things to keep up on when we're taking care of these patients. So it's always possible that they just may not be aware of the most recent guideline updates. So doing that education can be a huge uh, asset to their practice overall. Some of the other things that we've done here, and I know other institutions have been successful with, is also implementing locally validated guidelines. So for instance, here at Norton, we have a community acquired or an overall like pneumonia guideline where we talk about antimicrobial length of therapy. We share that with our medical staff as a whole, and we talk about what our expectations are for what should be normal. Now, Again, I'll put the caveat on that, that sometimes patients are immunocompromised and slow to improve and they need longer lengths of therapy. But the trap that we kind of fall into is if we say that about every single patient, then we're really kind of ignoring the guidelines as a whole. So we have to really be cognizant when we see those folks who are good candidates for these shorter lengths of therapy of actually following that recommendation and not really just talking ourselves into longer lengths of therapy because it's what we've conventionally done. Right, right. Back to, back to that convention that you, yeah. you spoke about. So, great, great. Dr. Ramirez, what, what do you, what thoughts do you have? You know, going, uh, because Ruth, you, you alluded that, that in the audience we have members that work in different settings. And, um, and in, uh, in different settings, because we're discussing community acquired pneumonia, in other settings, you no know, people dealing with uh, also COVID acquired pneumonia, but sometimes you no know, hospital acquired pneumonia, or sometimes you no know, ventilator or pneumonia. Because sometimes when you are working on a nursing home, well, by definition, you're going to have any COVID acquired pneumonia. But the nursing home pneumonia is something that is an in between. Yes. That that is, I, I wouldn't have guidelines for this type of of pneumonia. And Sarah, what would be your your consideration regarding? Uh, duration of therapy for, for other types of, of pneumonia? Sure. 
So in general, again, if we're looking to guidelines, we're looking at probably seven to 14 days for hospital onset or um, ventilator associated pneumonias. Um, as you alluded to that question of nursing home patients, or I know that you have the interest as well in truly immunocompromised populations of whether we can apply that same data, it is a little bit of a gray area. I would say for, from my end, for our community acquired pneumonia patients um, or those who are in a nursing home, what we're probably able to do is still look for those signs of clinical stability. So again, if your vital signs were abnormal, now they're not, it's day five, just because that patient is debilitated, they seem to have adequately mounted an immune response and have been able to recover. So the idea that we need to continue treating them just because they're a nursing home resident is probably something that I would push back on. But I think it is very appropriate to still be monitoring those patients closely. Obviously, if they're in a nursing home, we're able to kind of keep an eye on them and make sure they're not relapsing or anything like that. So just being aware that they may be a little bit more medically fragile doesn't inherently mean that we have to treat for longer, but we probably should be monitoring them very closely as much as we're able to. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well. <laughs> No, I, uh, no, I would, I would agree. Um, going back, I have another question uh, because again, the the the, the issue of, uh, and I completely agree. You no, know, that we are, as we are learning, and we're doing more studies, we are learning that in all infectious diseases, probably we were uh, uh, the duration of therapy was uh, excessive, uh, uh, but 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 considering. Uh, it's almost like a, a, how short do you think that we can use uh, antibiotics? Uh, and do you think that, that a particular class of antibiotics will allow us to, to do shorter duration of therapy? What, what do you see the, the antibiotic classes as playing a role here? With, with a, with a consider and, then I have, and then the other question, well, this would be one, no? what, what happened with the what class of antibiotics, any, may, may help us to, to decrease duration? Uh, and then, uh, do you think that, that because when we're given antibiotics in a patient with an infection, the only thing that, that we are asking the antibiotics to, to kill the, the bacteria. But the, but the other question, do you think that, that in patients with infections, do we need to kill all the bacteria or we just need to kill some of the bacteria? Uh, uh, and then uh, let the patient take care of the of the rest because um, and do you think that 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 different uh, uh, and this again these are two different questions um, mm -hmm. but but what do you think regarding any particular class of antibiotics that may help us to decrease even duration further duration of therapy? Sure. So. Um... As a pharmacist, I tend to think of antibiotics in, in kind of two ways. So it may be truly like the duration of therapy on the calendar, as well as how long the half-life of that drug is. So as an example, um, we know that azithromycin, which is one of the drugs we can use to treat community-acquired pneumonia, has a half-life of um, about 50 to 70 hours. So even though we're no longer giving doses of that drug, there are therapeutic concentrations in the body for quite a long time after we've stopped giving the antibiotic. So in those drugs with longer half-lives, that's something that we can consider is even though we're not continuing to actively give doses, they're probably still therapeutically active. So one of the best examples of this outside of community-acquired pneumonia is um, utilizing things like aminoglycosides to treat urinary tract infections. So particularly in our elderly patients who tend to have poor renal function, those drugs will remain therapeutic for probably three to five days with a single dose. So if we think that that's an appropriate management for that particular patient, then that might be a very good option because they're just one and done. Um, but I think that overall to your question, um, 
it probably is going to be somewhat dependent on how that individual drug is cleared from the body um, and how long that actually takes. Um, your second question about uh, how much bacteria is the right amount to kill, I tend to fall a little bit more on the side that our goal is probably never to eradicate bacteria entirely, particularly in an infection like community-acquired pneumonia. Our respiratory tract is not sterile. And if it was, probably wouldn't be the healthiest thing for us. So what we're really looking to do is probably just tip the scales a little bit, uh, kill off enough of the bacterial load that our immune system is able to kick in and do the rest. And that's kind of where I suppose that question of what do we do with immunocompromised pneumonia comes in because if we don't really have that same reserve to turn on an immune response, what exactly is the right thing to do? Um, so does that answer your question? No, no, yes, this is the, exactly. This brings the point of the immuno, if, if the goal is to kill enough bacteria that the immune system then take care of the rest, then the challenge is, is can we use clinical stability in the immunocompromise, because when we reach clinical stability, again, and this is the problem of microbiology. We, we, we can never measure the amount of bacteria, but we know that when we reach clinical stability, we are kill most of the bacteria, not all, but but if you are immunocompromised, you reach clinical stability. Killing a lot of the bacteria is enough. And the other challenge, this is why I said to me, is is it's going to be important. No, this is the next frontier, do, do, looking at, at, at studies of duration of therapy in immunocompromised uh, mm -hmm. individuals uh, to see just reaching clinical stability, even in these patients, maybe it's just a good marker to say, okay, I can stop antibiotics or not. Absolutely. And from a practical standpoint, very valid question. We have plenty of immunocompromised patients that we do want to know the right thing to do in that patient population. Uh, but the reality is that we also see that uh, the current guideline recommendation and all the non-immunocompromised patients that it applies to, we're still struggling to kind of follow those appropriate or maybe more optimal links of therapy. So I definitely have that question and I'm curious what we'll continue to learn in the future. But in the meantime, I think that it's still appropriate for us to, as much as we're able to advocate for those folks who there really isn't a question on whether clinical stability is enough. So we, we have a question on the chat that's it's somewhat related to this, that, you know, asking about the correlation between length of treatment in patients that have then underlying health conditions, the pulmonary conditions such as COPD. Mm. So um, in most of these trials that we've talked about, something like COPD alone as a diagnosis is not enough to say that this patient should be included in the trial. Now, if there's somebody who's on high doses of chronic steroids for their COPD, then they might fall a little bit more into that immunocompromised population. But overall with those patients, again, it's probably appropriate for us to mostly look at clinical stability with the recognition that those are some of the folks who may be a little bit slower to improve. But again, we can probably look to their vital signs as well as if they're able to eat normal mentation to tell us what the right thing is to do with that individual patient. Most of the patients that, that in your study here at Norton, um, that the patients stay in the hospital three to four days, but then get treated for 10. Uh, I imagine that, that in most of these patients, um, at the time that the patient go home, the patient is switched from IV to oral antibiotics. Correct, yes. Then the, the, the excessive duration of therapy happen uh, once the patient is discharged. Primarily, yes. And, and then as you alluded, instead of having some fixed number of days, the ideal situation would be to individualize therapy to define uh, how many how many days of antibiotics the patient needs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, again, I think that as we kind of discussed, a lot of convention probably driving our prescribing practices at discharge. And I think you absolutely nailed it, but individualized evaluation of those patients is probably the greatest change that we could make to how we're managing community-acquired pneumonia.
that's a great take home uh, take home message. Do we have any any other questions from the chat? I see we've got the the next session about Canada Oris from one of our public health uh, uh, epidemiologists, uh, public health partners for next week. Any any last comments or questions, Dr. Ramirez? Uh, uh, well, we can. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> you. But let me let me ask you. Let me ask you. Uh, at this moment, we are using clinical stability as, uh, and again, you no know, signs, symptoms, fever. Uh, do you see um, the a role of any markers, uh, you know, procalcitonin or any other markers to to define duration of therapy, or you feel confident that that, that our clinical approach to clinical stability is all that we need and we don't need to be looking for, for for the magic bullet, something in the laboratory that the doctor will feel confident? Well, <laughs> there's probably two ways to think about that from my perspective. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about, uh, particularly with in the context of viral illness, um, was something like procalcitonin. So I know that for whatever reason, probably because there is data to support it, that sometimes the providers do feel more comfortable when they see that low procalcitonin or low CRP, whatever marker you have. Um, and that might be what kind of tips the scales. And from a stewardship perspective, I feel, I suppose, a little bit utilitarian about it. Whatever gets the job done. On the other side, I would argue if you have this patient in front of you who we have evidence that would support the practice that says it's fine to stop antibiotics, waiting on that lab to tell you what you already know is probably something that we're really more doing for ourselves than we're doing for the management of the patient. Um, so sometimes those labs can be a bit of a I suppose, anti-anxiolytic for our providers. And if that's what kind of helps get us there until we feel more comfortable just following clinical criteria, then uh, so be it from my perspective. Very good, very pragmatic. Yes, but <laughs> I, I completely agree that, that just looking, nothing better than looking at the patient to see when the patient is getting better. And the only way to get better is that the colony count, whatever is the side of infection is decreasing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will not get better. Yes, we. It's almost like a, we have the, the the laboratory test when the patient is getting better because the whatever was the colony count at the beginning, ten to the nine, now it has to be ten to the fifth, ten to the fourth, ten to the third is is significantly decreasing. Um, well, um, do you have any other comments or questions, Ruth? Nothing else in the chat. Well, I think that then we have another very um, uh, interesting and up-to-date uh, discussion, in this case, duration of therapy coming from our um, uh, ID clinical experts that were here at Norton. Uh, and I also to mention to the group that any particular topic that you want to us to discuss, we have, uh, uh, we can always look at uh, our internal expert or, or going uh, outside. Mm -hmm. But um, Sarah, again, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation, the discussion. Uh, and then we uh, will see everybody this coming Wednesday. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.